Let me say what a great pleasure it is for me to be here. You've had the most incredible range of speakers. Um, a former head of the Global Fund, a deputy director of the CTC, uh, a former commissioner of uh, FDA, uh, a Stanford uh, historian of uh, incredible renown. So I feel very honored um, to, to be here to talk about what I feel the pharmaceutical industry can do in terms of making a positive uh, contribution to uh, global health. How many of you here were at Richard Feacham's lecture, the first lecture? Okay. And how many of you remember his last slide? Okay. I will also have a last slide, so I'll let you know when it comes and you can, uh, you can pay attention. Um, his last slide, he quoted, and I'm indebted to uh, Sir Richard Feacham for uh, the loan of this slide. Um, he quoted from a great Scotsman, and there are so many to choose from. <laughs> but William Hutchison Murray is one of my favorites. He was a writer, poet, and editor, um, and a mountaineer. And what Richard was um, talking about with this was, until you actually commit, you're never really going to know what the outcome is going to be. But until you commit, you're never going to know what it is you can do. And that, I believe, is, is also the story of pharmaceutical development. You never are actually going to know what the outcome is going to be. And there is always risk involved. But you have to take that step. What Richard didn't do is go on to finish this quote. And this quote finishes with um, Murray saying, Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. I'd like to talk today about the genius that I see every day at work in the pharmaceutical industry, about the power to change people's lives in a very positive way. And frankly, on a very personal level, the magic that has made me go to work every day for the past 30 years uh, to make a difference in public health. Now, not everyone agrees that the pharmaceutical industry makes a difference. Um, and some people feel that uh, our medicines cost an enormous amount, but they also cost a lot to buy. And I'm firmly of the opinion that You've only done half the job if you've developed the new medicine, unless you can get it to all the people who could potentially benefit from it. You haven't completed your task. And that was the step came to a head in the 90s, or the early part of the 20th, year 2000, when the cost of antiretrovirals and AIDS medicines uh, particularly as the epidemic was burgeoning in the developing world in Africa, it became very clear that it was not going to be possible, no matter what anyone earned, to pay for these medicines. This the transcript here is taken from an episode of The West Wing. I just imagine everyone watches The West Wing, but this was in the second series of The West Wing, and I think it's the fourth episode. There was no pre-read for this talk, but there is a post view. I want you to watch this episode, and there's something else I'm going to recommend that you watch, because this, I felt, dealt with the issue of price of pharmaceuticals, particularly as it related to a country in Africa, in a very balanced and in a very insightful way. The issue here was um, American companies hold patents. Most people in Africa can't afford to buy the drugs. They cost about 150 bucks a week. Well, that doesn't seem to be too bad. Yeah, but $43 a month as a salary, no matter what you make, is not going to help you with, with, um, uh, with buying these medicines. And I believe that AIDS activism went a long way to making us really address the issues of global health. 
and getting our medicines to the people who needed them. Now, that is fiction, but it was fiction addressing a real issue. The next post view is this movie. Who's seen The Carson Garden? Okay, well, your class dismissed. <laughs> um, and this talks about clinical trial is part of the plot occurring in an African country and about the issues, the ethics, or in this instance, the lack of ethics of the fictitious company that was conducting the trial. Now, this is a work of fiction. We'll talk about it a little bit later. The reality of pharmaceuticals in the developing world, I think, is very different. Now, you can actually look away from that if you want to. It's not an easy picture for some audiences. That patient in the middle is having a blepharotomy. Part of the eyelid is being removed because of trachoma, inclusion conjunctivitis, trachoma caused by chlamydia, same bacterium that causes non-specific urethritis, sexually transmitted disease. What happens is it gets into the eye and it causes inflammation. When it heals, ultimately, it causes scarring. It's inflammation of the, uh, the, the eyelids. It causes scarring, and the scarring causes the eyelid to turn inwards so that your eyelashes are constantly rubbing up and down against your cornea. Now, if you've ever had a piece of grit in your eye, you know what that's like. Well, if this is constantly day in, day out, um, you can imagine what that is like. The reason I show this slide is because the surgery, and this is in Tanzania, these are patients post-surgery, and this young uh, child here is taking a medicine, and he's taking azithromycin, which is given once a day as part of a WHO program called SAFE, which is surgery antibiotic, face washing with clean water and e-environmental factors to provide the clean water. And what we're actually doing is talking about eradication of this disease, eradication of blinding trachoma, which is the commonest cause of preventable blindness in the developing world. Now, Pfizer discovered and developed um, azithromycin, um, not with, I might add, trachoma in mind, but having done a clinical trial in Australia where blinding trachoma is still endemic among the Aboriginal population. Just consider that. A first world country with endemic trachoma. In the same way that Japan has <coughs> endemic Hansen's disease leprosy. There are still incredible issues around the world. And having done the trial in Australia to show that it was effective against trachoma, we were able to get approval for that uh, in partnership with the World Health Organization to uh, introduce azithromycin into the SAFE program. And it has been declared eradicated in Morocco. And we are hopeful that they will become eradicated in many other countries where it is currently endemic. That, I believe, is the truth of the impact that pharmaceuticals can have on global health. Now, uh, azithromycin is, is off patent. It is, in fact, for all of this, all of this time, we donated it to the program uh, in partnership with the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, formed an NGO to, to, to do that. There are so many examples of this that can make a difference in global health um, that a successful and um, thriving and innovative pharmaceutical industry can have such an incredible um, impact. Another program that I've been very closely associated with, um, and this really came about as a result of so much of the discussion around the cost of medicines for AIDS. 
Now, at the time, Pfizer did not have any uh, antiretrovirals. All of our protease inhibitors had, in fact, failed in the clinic. Well, through the clinic, as a result of safety, they just had failed. But we had fluconazole, an antifungal, which was very effective for cryptococcal meningitis and for esophageal candidiasis, um, which are opportunistic infections, which many patients with advanced HIV infection develop. Now, you saw from the West Wing quote, no matter what these cost, and they certainly on the private market were beyond the reach of anyone um, uh, on a modest salary. But even if you reduced the cost, which there was a great deal of pressure at the time, there was no guarantee that people would get them uh, or that they would necessarily be able to afford them. So what we did was we developed the Diflucan Partnership Program, which ensures, and this is very important, and I'll talk about this in a moment, authentic Diflucan for Comisol. Make sure that it got to the people who needed it. That we made sure that the clinics trained, that the clinics treating the patients were fully trained in making the diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis, which as you know, requires a lumbar attack, requires a CSF examination, an India ink stain. And that they would then also be able to counsel the patients that when you start on this, you have to take your medicine for the rest of your life. Now when we set this program up, the goal was that if you were in the program, you would get the medicine for the rest of your life. And people said, how long will that be? And the answer is, of course, you don't know. But it goes back to William Hutchison Murray. You have to commit. You have to say you're going to do something and follow through. And Diflucan came off patent a couple of years after this program was started. And the program continues. The program was started, we um, started it on World AIDS Day, 2000. December 1st. And 11 years later, the program is still running. And millions of doses have been handed out. And while this is not a cure for cryptococcal meningitis, it has made a huge difference. And I know that many lives have been saved as a result of this sort of program. It started in South Africa. We started it in partnership. And I should point out that every one of these programs that I will talk about is always done in partnership. A company like Pfizer can't just go into a country and say, okay, we're going to solve your cryptococcal meningitis problem, or we're going to solve your trachoma problem. It's not our responsibility. The public health of a nation is the responsibility of its government. But if you can work in partnership with the governments, with the NGOs on the ground, you can make an enormous difference. And from 2000, when we started in South Africa, you can see there are over 60 countries in which this program has been expanded, which includes training of health workers, treatment of the patients, and follow-up of the patients to ensure that they stay on their medication. This program has been um, a success. I said we didn't have any antiretrovirals at the time, and, and we didn't, but we were studying. We were uh, working on different approaches, and we did find a novel approach to uh, HIV treatment, the CCR5 entry inhibitors. There are two, basically two portals of entry into the cell for the, the, uh, uh, the human immunodeficiency virus, CCR5 being the predominant pathway. If you can stop the cell, if you can stop the virus getting into the cell, you can effectively prevent the, 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 the infection taking hold. And uh, we were able to bring this, this medicine to, to market. That's part of it. In Africa, as I'm sure many of you know, the biggest risk for a woman getting HIV is to be married. Because she very often has no negotiating rights within her. She has no idea where her husband or spouse may have been. And she certainly can't ask him to wear a condom. So the microbicide program, 
uh, the international uh, my, uh, partnership for microbicides was created in 2002. <coughs> microbicides, as you probably know, are gels or creams which are applied intravaginally, which, with the right medication, could potentially prevent the virus from entering uh, into the bloodstream, into the woman's bloodstream. Now, up until now, results from the microbicide, various microbicide trials have been, uh, have been disappointing. And some of us are not entirely sure that it will be possible to conduct the trials in the way that would show their true efficacy. But the only way you will find that out is if you design the trials properly and you do them. And when the Microbicide Initiative approached us about Miraviroc, and they said, you know, this, I know you want this to be taken systemically, but we believe this could be used locally, vaginally, could be very helpful. We said to them, you know, yes, do that. We are not focusing on that at the moment, but if you want to do that, we will give you a pure substance, we will give you high quality material, and you can work on that. And they are currently um, developing that. It's not that simple because you take pure substance, but you have to put it into a form that can be used. And that involves um, manufacturing and chemistry and, and stability, and, and it is very complicated. And one of the problems when you apply to any uh, creams or medicines, gels, to any mucosa, is that you increase the perfusion, you increase the blood flow to that mucosa. And that could potentially put the subject at even greater risk. Um, if uh, this were to be the case. Nonetheless, it's exactly the sort of thing that I think in partnership you can make a huge difference. I really hope that microbicides work out. Think of the empowerment for women. So for men, if they are able to use something that could prevent infection, but you have to do the trials. Um, anyone know who this is? Felix Hoffman, of course, damn Felix Hoffman, I knew that. Um, he discovered aspirin in 1897. Very important man. As Michelle mentioned, I was involved in clinical trials with group in Oxford, group in Philadelphia, um, and um, at NIH, doing cardio prevention studies with astelsalicylic acid in um, the 90s. You've got to keep working, looking for new indications and new applications, and sometimes it's called rescuing medicines, sometimes it's called repurposing, I just like to think of it as innovation. And we've discovered over 150 years just so much about aspirin. I mean, this probably, um, now I'm assuming, well, there's no one over 40 in the audience, so I, I'm guessing no one's taking aspirin, and I'm going to start taking it when I hit 40, but um, <laughs> um, it, it's important to keep working and keep looking for new opportunities, applications. Because something as simple as that, in doing the clinical trials, can make an, uh, an impact, a positive change to millions of lives. The clinical trials are the basis of our, they're our bread and butter. They're, they're what we do. Uh, and if we are an innovative pharmaceutical industry, it's what separates us from the generic companies who take products off patent and run with them. I often think of medicines as a bit like children. You all hope your children are going to be the best and the smartest in the world. Sometimes that turns out that way. Um, sometimes they don't, but you try and make the most out of them no matter what. You certainly don't move house when they're at school. Um, and generics are a bit like teenagers. They've, they're going out into the world now. 
But everything that they are going to do, and you hear people talk about generics, they're, they're the best thing, they're, they're reasonably priced, and you know, we should just all have generics. You can't become a teenager without going through all the years that lead up to that. And that is what the pharmaceutical industry, the innovative pharmaceutical industry does, is develop, hopefully, really robust and effective teenagers. Now, clinical trials must be done to the highest possible standard, with the highest ethics, and they must be carried out in exactly the same way, whether you do it here in Stanford, whether you do it in South Africa, or any of these countries that I show them on the Daphne Gap slide, for example. Now, uh, you'll You'll be able to go to this scene in uh, the Constant Gardener when you when you revisit it um, after this this talk. But basically, what um, the, the scene for those of you to, to remind you is an open air clinic. There are lots and lots of, of people um, with children, without children, and uh, the the Englishman from the British uh, consulate. Uh, gets a hold of a piece of paper and says, what does I see? Well, that's informed consent. And this treatment is, this is the, the medication that is being uh, 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 tested by the pharmaceutical company uh, in, in the movie. He said, if, if they don't give consent, so it's I, it, I see yes, no, if they don't give consent, they lose the right to medical care. Now, that is a violation every possible ethical rule in the book. If you are going to enroll in a clinical trial, it has to be very clear that you are going into a clinical trial first and foremost. That there are choices you don't need to go into. No one should be forced to go into a clinical trial. And if you decline, it is without prejudice and that treatment that you would normally get is available to you. Sometimes, and it's important to remember, clinical trials are a form of therapy and are a form of treatment. And sometimes it's an opportunity to get the latest medication. Now, it's of course being tested, um, but the, imp the implication here is you either go into the trial and you get all of this, or you don't go into the trial, and you're turned away, which is what happens in the movie. It is a work of fiction. And that should never happen. You must be clear that you're going into a trial. You must, be, you must give your consent willingly. And if you are a child, then obviously your parent or guardian needs to, needs to do that. No. At about the same time as the book came out, which was in the year 2000, um, Pfizer was in the, in the media a great deal around a, a clinical trial that, that we had conducted in uh, Nigeria with uh, an antibiotic called Trova. And that has been explored in the media and in the courts and uh, in, in many different ways. One of the questions that was asked was around informed consent and the importance, and I stress that again, the importance of ensuring that informed consent is obtained. Now, when you have, the, the Trovan trial was being done for epidemic um, meningococcal meningitis in Nigeria, part of the uh, meningitis belt in Africa, running from Eritrea all the way across um, to Senegal, and as you know, the Harmattan winds come down from the Sahara. And, um, in April, May, June, um, there are these incredible epidemics. And in 1996, this trial was conducted when the, one of the worst epidemics, there were about 11,000, more than 11,000 people died as a result of that. And the question I've often been asked is, in epidemic conditions, is it right to test a new medicine? Well, if you can guarantee that it will be done
to the same standards that you would do it anywhere else in the world, then I believe the answer is yes. Where do you place your clinical trials as a global company and in a global world? Obviously, you need to study endemic diseases in endemic countries. You can't study malaria in Palo Alto, or not to a great deal, because you're not going to see any of it. What about testing a new medicine for diabetes? Well, I think you probably all know that India is currently facing a diabetes epidemic, which is, and other non-communicable diseases, which is as worrying from a global health perspective as communicable diseases are. So I believe that the people of India, if you're going to study a new medicine for diabetes, the people of India deserve that new treatment as much as the people in California or anywhere else in the world, as long as the trials are done to the same high standards. Something like meningitis is, a, is an interesting case because while we're taught that the untreated, the mortality of meningitis is probably somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. You know, I think if you're a treating physician, you can, should consider that it is 100 percent. And if you had a child, you were one of your children with meningitis, you would assume that that child was going to die unless treated. So in that circumstance where your child is well in the morning and starts to get unwell by lunchtime and is is about to die by the afternoon. That is a very, very difficult situation in which to conduct a clinical trial. And yet, unless we collect the data, we will never know. And I believe that as long as you can ensure that the parents, it's, if it's children, it's not going to be um, and the patient, but the parents, the guardians are fully informed and that the, the greatest safeguards are taken, then I believe that we should always look for ways um, to conduct clinical trials. Um, it's why I went into the pharmaceutical industry, to find the data. And we're only as good as the data we collect. I talked about malaria. We could probably eradicate malaria Dean Barry might disagree, but I think if we, if we put our minds to it, we could probably eradicate it. Something like meningitis is harder to eradicate, but malaria, we could probably eradicate that. We've got the medicines. We know how to prevent it. We don't need to go into a discussion of DDT here, but if you've ever visited um, hospitals, homes, orphanages in Africa, you will see old nets with huge holes in them that malaria, that the mosquito can get through. People don't know how to, if you've ever tried to sleep under a mosquito net, you will know how difficult it is to tuck it under the, the mattress and get it. Uh, and if you don't teach people how to open a new uh, impregnated uh, net and make sure that it is uh, um, uh, properly aerated, they will, they will suffocate from the smell of, the, uh, of, of the, the, the coating and the treatment. And another way of, of working to, um, to, to make a difference is partnering around obviously getting the treatment to people, but getting the treatment I hope I've made clear is not enough. You've constantly got to be looking for new treatments. We will never have enough treatments. We will never have enough medicines. As an industry, we're often criticized as not being interested in curing diseases, because if we cured them all, we wouldn't know what to do. And death shall have play for lack of work. Shakespeare, all's well that ends well. Even 450 years ago, he, was, he thought how risible that was. And we are still going to have our work cut out for us. So researching medicines is one thing, but also making sure that people get the treatments, showing people how to use um, the treatments, how to make the right diagnoses, not misdiagnosing the febrile child 
and treating them with anti-malarials when in fact it's bacterial pneumonia that they have. Making sure that um, we are uh, doing everything we can to build a system and measuring its effectiveness. This is a program that we're running, um, in fact, with uh, the governments in Senegal, Ghana, and, and Kenya, all endemic areas, to try and make sure the treatments get to people, but also um, fulfilling filling the education gaps and then measuring how effective it is. This program's been running for a couple of years now, and we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing some results. What these programs do, whether it's a clinical trial, whether it's something like Diflugan, or whether it's something like this malaria program, ensure that people get the genuine medicine. Now, there's a lot of stuff out there that looks like the real thing. One of these is real Viagra, and one of these is, one of these is real Lipitor. And it's, it's hard for even experts to tell the difference. They may contain some of the active ingredient. That's actually the real one on this side, and that's the real one here. They may have too much of it. This, this uh, Viagra um, had three times as much the maximum legal dose. Now, I don't know. I, I doubt that Koreans need three times the maximum legal dose. Um, but sildenafil citrate is a vasodilator. That could cause incredible hypotension and could be immensely dangerous to anyone getting that medicine. Similarly, in Hungary, this, this, um, this Viagra, well, for a start, it's the wrong color. It's, it's sort of the right shape, but it's got a amphetamine in it. These are, these are a, this is an appalling situation. And what, and here's, countries where the legitimate supply, and these are all Pfizer products on, on, on the, the left, just to sh give you an idea. There's, there's anti-inflammatories, there's Viagra, everyone. You would think Viagra would be the commonest to counterfeit. It's not really. Um, uh, Antihypertensive, uh, anti-cholesterol, pain medicine, anti-infectives. Um, breached in the most incredible number of places. And how does it get there? Well, it gets, it gets manufactured. These, these are, I'm going to tell you a little story about Canadian medicines. It gets manufactured here in China. It finds its way to Macau. It then finds its way into, that's Iran. It then finds its way, and this is the key spot, it gets, finds its way into the European Union. And once it gets in there, it's like laundering money. It's legitimate. And then it can find its way into Miami. It's, it can go to um, any number of places. It then gets recycled back again, further legitimizing it. And then it finds, well, by, it's not Miami, it's into the, it's the Bahamas, actually. It's into the Caribbean. Then it gets back here. That way, it's been twice through the EU. And then it's truly legitimate. Uh, it can find its way into Canada. Um, so the prices may be something to smile about, but your, your Lipitor contains meth methamphetamine. Your Viagra has three times um, the dose. Or it may even have rat poison or who knows what's in it. This is a major public health issue. Here's, here's the sort of place that, um, that these medicines are being made in. And I can tell you that the Pfizer facilities do not look like that. <laughs> this was uh, counterfeit Viagra in China. You know that they're making souvenir statues by day. Um, not surprisingly, this is, here's, here's some little packs of Viagra. Here's something else, and here are guns and rounds of ammunition. It's criminal. And what, so much so that the WHO has very clearly seen this, what the innovative 
ethical pharmaceutical industry does is not only research medicines, it ensures that they are manufactured to the highest quality. It ensures that they are shipped and imported and received according to the law. And it means that the medicine that you are taking is the medicine that your doctor has prescribed for you and not something else. Now, we have a huge issue in public health, which is the, f the, the, the fact of, of education and literacy. I talked about um, the importance for um, a woman to have negotiating rights within her marriage. I believe the single most important public health measure that we could take globally is to educate girls and women. They would make much wiser health choices with that education. And when you have, this is Nigeria, I'm indebted to Nick Eberstadt at uh, the American Enterprise Institute for, for these data. This just, this is um, uh, fairly recently shows that about half the population of Nigeria have no education at all. That a tiny percent um, have um, some kind of tertiary university education. The data are almost identical for India. But the fact that someone, so you saw the pictures of the medicines, even if you get the right medicine, being able to follow the instructions and understand how to take it is a major challenge that we need to face and we need to be clear about. Which is why one of the activities that I'm particularly engaged in and supportive of at Pfizer is a partnership with a, a group in South Africa called Books of Hope, which is trying to empower low literacy patients. The fact that you can't read or write does not mean that you are not concerned about your health. And we should never assume that um, because uh, someone can't read or write that um, we can't speak to them, that we can't communicate with them. And these are 16-page speaking books um, where this one is about what it means to be in a clinical trial, which said a lot of the things I said earlier. Um, the safe use of medicines. Don't take someone else's medicines. Don't sell the medicines you've been given. And don't buy medicines from the street corner or from a street trader because they may very well be those ones that have found their way um, into the, um, in, into the uh, illegally into the chain. This one here about blood pressure was actually developed with the New York City um, Department of Health um, for uh, newly arrived immigrants from the subcontinent of India uh, on the importance of, of staying healthy and has been translated into, into several other um, languages. The way these are, they're highly colored and they have a soundtrack and you press these buttons and they speak to you and they tell you about never starting to smoke. This is not about stopping smoking. This is aimed at young children never starting to smoke. Taking your medicines, what it means to be in a clinical trial. These can all make an enormous difference to public health, and I think we are, we are, we are getting there. Pharmaceutical companies have three things. They have medicines, and we must, as I've said, always keep studying and researching for new medicines. We have obviously enormous resources and wherever we can invest those in things like educational projects or literacy programs, we must do that. But probably our greatest resource is people. And finally, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about a program that Pfizer has called the Global Health Fellows Program. These are um, Pfizer colleagues who can take three to six months off to go and work for an NGO at the moment, it is focused around the diseases of, of the Global Fund, which is HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. And they're matched with an NGO. The NGO says, I need, and it could be doctors, it could be nurses and healthcare workers, but they may have expanded. They may need human resources support. They may need finance support. And this is an opportunity for anyone from any part of Pfizer, um, from all over the world, 
uh, our organization to be matched with an NGO and go and work. And at the moment, um, we've worked in, in uh, 40 countries. Um, I can't exactly remember. There are more now than 270. Every one of these things may seem like a drop in the ocean. But ultimately, I believe that they make a huge difference when put together and sustained um, to make uh, a difference to global health. On a very personal level, in 1989, when my partner then was diagnosed with his first uh, episode of pneumocystis carini, we didn't really have anything. We had aerosolized pentamidine, which later we found probably cotrimoxazole would have been better. We had um, AZT, zidovudine. We There was a clinical trial with DDI going on, which he was able to get into. But almost as was par for the course then, two years later, he died, as was, would have been expected. Now, of course, there was appalling sadness for me and for his family at that time. But I also felt enormously privileged to work in an industry that could potentially find a cure. And I felt that I could help shape the research agenda. Now, I'm only one person in a company of, of 100,000 people. But in 1989, 1990, there was enormous reticence to discuss many of these issues. And I felt that there was an opportunity within my company and within my industry to make a difference. And I believe that's what everyone who works in a pharmaceutical company does. They try and make a difference. And with that commitment, I think that's where the genius, the power, and the magic is. Now, my fellow Scotsman, anyone know who that is? Robert Louis Stevenson. And he did not, sadly, live to a great age. But Robert Louis Stevenson said, um, basically, the journey is what is important, not the, the goal or the arrival. Well, yes, I, I understand what he's saying, but I believe that what is important is knowing what the, the arrival city might be. And that arrival city is eradication. That arrival city is cure. That arrival city is pain-free. We've got a long way to go, but without an innovative pharmaceutical industry, I do not believe we have a chance of ever reaching that. And that is what makes me go to work every day. So thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to come and talk, and I hope that we'll have a chance to have a discussion, Michelle.